Welcome to the official podcast of the British Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Whether you're a seasoned dental professional, an eager student, or simply someone curious about the intricacies of cosmetic dentistry, you're in the right place. Here at the BACD, we bring together the brightest minds, groundbreaking research, and innovative practices from across the UK and beyond. In each episode, we aim to delve deep, offering insights, sharing stories, and demystifying the beautiful world of cosmetic dentistry. I'm Simon Chard, president of the BACD, and I'm thrilled to have you join us on this enlightening journey. Let's dive right in. Hi, Richard. Thank you for joining me on this uh, BACD podcast. Um, Absolute pleasure, Sam. Good to see you. Before I introduce you and say, you know, it would be a long list of introductions, we'd take, take the whole podcast, I know. But <laughs> let's, let's introduce yourself um, and we can then move on with, with uh, what we've got to talk about today. Yep. Uh, my name is Richard Coates. I'm a cosmetic dentist and general dentist working in Sunderland in the northeast of England. Um, I got, um, I've been involved with the BACD for a lot of years now and I'm one of the accredited members of the British Academy uh, and also working towards American Academy accreditation at the moment. You really can't. You, you've underplayed that because BACD accreditation is not an easy feat and, uh, and it's, uh, it's incredibly difficult to achieve. So we obviously congratulate you and we do. We are very grateful for all of our accredited members. Uh, Thank you very so much. For everybody listening, uh, my name is Dr. Sam Jethwa. I'm a board member at the BACD and I'm currently the vice president at the Academy. And we're incredibly proud to have Richard not only as a friend and a colleague, uh, in cosmetic dentistry, but also somebody who's presenting at our annual conference. And now I have firsthand sat in Richard's lectures and hands-ons, and it is second to none. So uh, I think you're in for a treat. Uh, so Richard, regarding your uh, your hands-on at conference, yes, what is it that you are planning to to give to the to the delegates who are coming to spend some time with you there? Many of the hands-on courses around the world, and I've been on many. Uh, focus usually on a fractured single tooth. Uh, I'm going to teach people how to build, rebuild a tooth, but not just the fractured single tooth. I'm going to focus on one single composite veneer, uh, which means I'm going to have to cut an awful lot of teeth myself because there's no preformed teeth in that kind of shape. But I want to create a situation where we can actually rebuild one single veneer tooth that's already got an incisal fracture on top of that as well. So there'll be a mixture of skills in mixing thicknesses of composite, multi-layering composites, dentines, enamels. I'm going to bring into it highlights and also translucency. Uh, I'm going to emulate nature completely by recreating nature using composite. Uh, I know I've only got a three-hour window per set of delegates, but in that time, I'm sure I can give enough hints and tips that they can all take them back to their practices and institute them to create some really marvellous effects. So, Richard, you mentioned emulating nature there. What, yeah. what is it that, because I've seen your work and it's exemplary, and you really couldn't tell that there's restoration there. What, I mean, I know this is what the hands-on is going to be about. It's what yeah. they need to do in our practices, or what we can do in our practices, try and replicate that kind of work. But are there a couple of tips, that, like very short top three things or so, that you would always recommend in terms of before you go in and place this, place this composite? What are the things that you always look for in order to emulate emulate nature? Is it the translucency, the texture? What are the kind of game changers, would you say? The game changers are, and you've covered that pretty well, Sam. The, the, the tooth has to have, rather than the single layer composite that you usually um, use and were taught to use at dental school, if you just start thinking and strip everything back and create the enamel shades where the enamel ought to be and in the same thicknesses, the dentine, certainly, if you've got a fractured tooth where there's a transition line between the fracture and the actual restoration, there has to be a dentine shade that's opaque enough. And most of the single composites aren't opaque enough. You have to have a specialist dentine to actually merge onto that fracture line, and that gets rid of it visually. Uh, after that, you build in the translucency. And one of the main thing is, if you get the actual form of the tooth, that's the shape of the tooth is prime, what I call primary morphology. Now the, the folds within the tooth, which are the line angles and the mammalon grooves, mm -hmm. secondary morphology. And if you look at a tooth and you're copying the tooth next door, you want to copy the texture of the tooth as well. Yes. 
if you look at some of the, the greatest mimics in the world, or your cuttlefish, your octopus, if you actually look at some videos of them, they don't just Im emulate colour, they emulate the texture, particularly octopi, uh, or octipodes, depending whether you're going Greek or Roman, but uh, you can actually emulate the actual texture as well as the colour, just yeah. disappears, disappears. Wow. So, so really it's an understanding of not only of form and shape, but also material, colour, so hues and chroma. Yes. Uh, and the internal structure of the tooth itself. So there's a lot to go through and th there's a lot that they're actually going to take away from that session, I think. Uh, is there, there is, Sam, there, there is. I, I, I could lecture on this for days. Yeah. Obviously, it's a hands-on session, so I'm not going to bore everybody with a fine detail of everything, but I want to make it a completely practical exercise. I'm going to sit at the front and I'm going to go through each stage step by step so nobody's left behind and everybody has plenty of time to work. Uh, I'm going to create some stents, um, some incisal edge stents. Uh, I'm using more rather than silicon putty stents. I'm using a lot of very, very rigid stents these days uh, that are fluid to start with. Uh, and then it, you get the, the creation of the palatal morphology first. Everybody's seen kind of guys start to build, build things up from scratch. But I want, I want to show how you can actually get that. It's not just a fractured tooth we're doing. It, 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 this is veneers equally. Mm. It's not an easy, quick fix. This is going to be how you can create world-class restorations. And the patients will pay for a world-class restoration yeah, yeah. and the time it takes. I'm a slow dentist. I'm not a fast dentist. I don't use the word speedy in anything that I do. And there's certainly a place in our market for that kind of thing. But people who come to my courses, nobody will be ridiculed. They're going to be an absolute safe space. There is no stupid question because I've asked most of them in the past. Um, so there isn't a stupid question that anybody can ask during the course. Uh, uh, I Equally, I can't be offended. So uh, I'm just one of these guys that everything bounces off. So anybody can ask me anything. And I'm really looking forward to getting everybody in the room so they can ask ask every question from people who are inexperienced and want to learn the master craft to people who are already doing some masterful work and actually just want to get better. And that was what I was going to ask you next, actually, is who, who would be best suited to come along to that? And it really is as wide as, as that, isn't it? Because I've seen yeah, it is. in the past, and one of the things that's really quite um, amazing is you can be great at the work, but teaching it is different. And what you yeah. do is you manage to break it down so that anybody can really follow the steps. So yeah. whether you have a workflow, you can introduce new bits into that or modify yeah. what you're doing. But also, if you are new to it, you can actually implement the workflow straight away on the Monday when we go back into the, uh, go back into practice. So I think it will apply to everybody. Um, yeah, the, everybody learns differently. I learn from, I mean, I've learned from the masters in the world. I've spent a lot of time traveling around. And if I can just go away with one or two significant tips yeah. from any of their hands-on courses, I take those away with me and I institute them instantly into practice. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not talking about, I, I'm not wanting to go along to a big formatted course. I'd rather learn key tips of some of the real world masters. Yeah. And I hope if, if anybody takes away one or two tips from my course, well, of course, I'd be abs super proud that they're actually improving their dentistry. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah it's, it'll be a good day. So your, your summer method is focused um, not only on in, incredible clinical practice. I mean, you practice nearly every day of the week, I believe, and you still yeah. are, are teaching as well on top of that, plus yeah. working towards your now the AACD accreditation, which you've already completed yes. BACD. And I mentioned that's not an easy thing to do. To, to achieve so much within dentistry, there, there's got to be a drive. There's something that's kind of driving you to achieve all these ambitious things and actually get there to the end. What, what would you say yours is? What's been your kind of background to lead you to where you are now? If I stay with the dentistry that I learned at dental school and stuck with it, and I did for a while, while I sort of perfected what I was going to do then, then I thought, how am I going to improve things? And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a traveller. I like travelling around. So it was a great excuse to go to Europe to start with. The UK first, and then I expanded to Europe. It gave me the opportunity to travel. And then the more and more speakers I saw, and I was coming back to work thinking, okay, I need to institute this now. And that sparked my interest. Mm -hmm. I never look at what I'm doing and think, well, we are there now. 
I'll look yes. at somebody and say, right, how can I actually improve what, what we are doing? And that drive creates motivation. And I never, I love my job. Mm -hmm. I love my job because I cha probably change it on a daily basis. And I'm always looking for something new to learn. And I hope the guys, and certainly people who turn up to the BACD, they've got to have a similar mindset yeah. where they can actually change up what they're actually doing. The digital formats are now coming through. I mean, dentistry is so exciting. I I feel a little sad. I've probably only got a decade left. And it's like, uh, that, that I, want, I want to know what ha what's going to happen in 20, 30 years' time. Uh, but certainly, if you stick with what's new and what's right at the cutting edge, mm -hmm. you'll keep your motivation. You want your patients feed off that. The patients feed off that and will pay for the better dentistry. Yeah, I'm, I'm in one of the lowest socially demographic areas in the country mm. a lot of people say who don't know where Sunderland is they say it's okay for you practice in the Sunderland man you want to visit here someday it's like they, but the people who want to the dentistry people pay for what they want not what they need yeah and if they can find a practitioner and hopefully I can give you some of this motivation I go to these courses to recharge my batteries mm. Simple as that. I go, I go to the conferences to recharge my batteries. Because there's always days where you look at things and you know, oh, everybody sighs. And thinks, you know, a patient's criticising something I think is absolutely phenomenal. We all have patients like that. Yeah. And days like that. But if you can motivate yourself and keep going, it just, it improves everything. It improves the atmosphere and the practice for, mm. for, for, for the team in particular, certainly yourself and the patients. And I hope I can actually instill, because I'm going to talk a little bit about business and, and dentistry generally while I'm doing the clinical. Yeah. Perfect. And just say how I actually can actually tell the, uh, and inform the patients as the difference between what I'm doing and what other dentists are doing. I think that's important because actually when we, when we all learn, we're always focusing on learning the clinical skills, aren't we? But yes, often we nobody really tells you or teaches you how to communicate yeah. that to the patient. So no, the value, what you've just gone on and spent your weekend and traveled and spent the money and, and yeah. time away from the family or whatnot learning. Mm -hmm. But actually, the patient doesn't quite value that automatically because they don't know all of that. So how do we communicate that? You know, how is your composite that you've learned out on Richard's course at the BACD going to be mm -hmm. worth a lot more of the patient's time, your time, and in terms of value as well? So that would be very interesting to hear how yeah. you practice in your clinic in Sunderland but are working at the top end of the of the private dentistry market in yes. that that's actually really fascinating so i think yeah. it is one of the things that i know the BACD does want to focus on is how to implement these things because yeah. it's, it's it's key so have you have you always been in that area or have you worked elsewhere as well or is that is that your home home ground and you kind of stuck around I've worked Gates at Newcastle. I've worked down in Darling. I have been moved around. I think uh, I think one of the practices I was working at is the only one to ever be closed because of a compulsory purchase order. So mm -hmm. sometimes I've had to be forced to move. But uh, I've worked in Sunderland certainly for the last twenty years. It's, um, and, but I'm, I did move around a bit for the uh, initially trying to find a home because mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, particularly with the the better quality dentistry, sometimes you're working with practitioners who don't want simply don't want to get into that market yeah. and often it's best to find practitioners who are willing to actually see your vision and, and and follow that and walk alongside with you and support you because it's very difficult to work with somebody who just wants to do the very basic dentistry and do the really high-end things I'm not going to criticize that I was a pure NHS dentist for 10 years mm. I was a mixed dental practitioner for t another 10 years and for 10 years after that, I've been purely private. So wow. I've been in every camp. I'm not going to sit there and say everything's okay for me. It, 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 it started, it was difficult. But You've been there. You've been there. Those skills. Yeah, I've been there and done it, yes. With, with, um, so being, being in one place for 20 years, have you, you've obviously seen your cases come back, and that makes us better, yes. dentists, doesn't it, to see our yes. own failures, our successes? Absolutely. What are the few things would you say that you've changed or learnt along the way? that now you feel dent your dentistry is much more predictable. Because I remember, as a simple example, when I was in the NHS um, for the first few years after graduating, I went on a course. I learned how to do composite inlays and onlays um, yeah. for posterior teeth. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, it was, it was just doing loads of them. 
And yes. it didn't take long for me to stick around in the practice to see most of them come back failed because I didn't have the occlusion and bonding understanding that, you know, I may now yeah. do. So choosing the cases wasn't right. But had I moved on so quickly, perhaps only a year later or six months later or something like that, I would never have seen those failures. I'd never have really got better. But you've been there, you've stuck around and you've learned new things implemented. What yeah. are the things that you think you've seen change or that you feel now is much more predictable for you? The materials have got much better, but the materials are still only 5% of what we do. I yeah. think our skills have improved. Uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but you, you, you do learn more from your failures than your successes. Yeah. And that communication with the patient is key. All dentistry will fail. And I'm quite proud to tell the patient that. You know, These patients have managed to destroy perfectly good nature. Mm. And our job is to restore that. And if you just instill a realistic expectation mm. to the patient of what, the, tell the patient, look, I've seen my cases last five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. My composite, my big composite cases, I'm not giving longer than a 10 year guarantee on that mm. because I haven't seen the full success. I've been doing a certain level for a certain amount of years. Yes. Uh, I'll give them 20 years on porcelain, 10 to 20, realistically. Equally, I'll have patients sometimes come along to me with unrealistic expectations. Mm. Now, I'm sure they'll be happier to see another dentist, and I'm sure another dentist may fulfill their expectations. But if I can actually work that out, I'm pretty good at it now, whether I'm going to be able to fulfill somebody's expectations or not, yeah. then my life's an easier, easier life, and I'm sure the patient can go, and go somewhere else. But I'll do that, and I'll be going over this on the course, Mm. with the power of the mock-up okay mock up so everything from a single tooth to mm. a full smile wow. and if you think that simple mock-up at a first consultation is pretty good and the patient picks holes in it then maybe they're better off with work with somebody else and or maybe they're just after something completely different and mm. if i can't work out what the patient's expectations are then uh, but I'll talk more about this because I'm a real dentist. I'm not going to give stars and flashing lights and send, send up send up rockets and, and, and just when and see all the dazzling material that quite often I've seen fail in the past. Everybody get a realistic expectation of what to expect from the restoration and what to teach them how to do and the longevity of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm quite proud to say, well, you don't do this with porcelain, but I'm quite proud to say that composites sometimes need some maintenance. Yeah. And the patient, it's all about realistic expectations. And the patient is very happy. They're not disappointed if anything needs polished in two, three years' time, you know? This is your experience talking. You know, it's your, your, you're totally confident with your clinical work, of course. And yeah. that, um, that goes into having been stuck at sticking around long enough to see the failure. So you can be really sure when yeah. you tell the patient this is going to work or this isn't going to work. Yeah. Uh, and then that, that controls the, the, um, the, the outcomes, doesn't it? In terms of expectation. Yeah. Sam, I'll see some of the work that I did five or 10 years ago. Yeah. And I look at it and think, oh, why did I do that? Oh, there's so many better ways of doing this. Yeah. But it was what was available at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, what we are all doing now in 50 years time, will see, be seen as archaic and old fashioned. And that's we, why we work with what we've got now. That's why we keep attending. So we keep having the conferences where we keep learning Absolutely. new things, even if it's just taking it a little bit further. When you actually add those increments up in five year period, you look back and think, God, um, what was I what was I doing then? And you thought that was great at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't criticize any dentists for staying within a certain realm of where they're going, but they tend to be in when I talk to them, they tend to be the more unhappy dentists. Hmm. Uh, whereas you, you go to somewhere like the British Academy conferences, you're surrounded by like-minded people. Yeah. Some people are just trying it out to mm -hmm. see what they think. Some are absolutely riveted and they, they recharge their batteries every year, certainly by going to the British Academy. Yeah. And I would encourage anybody to come along, try different courses, try mine, try a, a lot of the other courses. You'll get, some of the, your, the other courses will be for faster dentistry. I just personally, I'd, you have to decide in yourself as a profession what kind of dentist do you want to be? Slow, fast, volume, quality, you know, it's a, and, and 
I, I would never criticize anybody who picks one particular genre of dentistry that they want to go into. But certainly the genre that I'm doing, I'm doing I, I mean, I've got a full diploma in implantology. And, you know, I, I, I got, there's multiple facets to what I do. Uh, can you be a specialist in everything? I, I tend to leave a lot of the major orthodontics alone. I do some simple alignment using Invisalign. But other than that, I tend to let people way more qualified than me to do, do some of the orthodontic bits before I'll come in with my, uh, my skills. So, it's, uh, would, you, so and, would you say yeah. that even though maybe you, I know from, from my experience, I did a lot of implant training, et cetera, I don't place any implants now, but I can treatment plan any implant case. Yeah. So when a patient sees us, they have the right advice uh, you know, at the consultation stage. So Richard, obviously we've discussed your um, background and like how you've ended up doing the kind of dentistry you're doing and what you yes. want to impart onto your delegates at the BACD um, at the conference. Outside of dentistry, if you have any time left at all, what are your passions? What do you like doing? Uh, I, I cycle everywhere. Okay. I, I'm really fond of food, so I have to cycle everywhere, if you, if you know what I mean. So, uh, for instance, I'm into work today with my bike. Yeah. I'll go out on, you know, 60, 70 mile rides wow. uh, the weekends. Um, I occasionally go uh, scuba diving as well in the North Sea here. Um, yeah. And during the winter, I, I'm a snowboarder. I've never learned how to ski, so uh, I'm the oldest snowboarder on the hill. It's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, North Sea diving is uh, is challenging. It's, wow. it's you know, it's, um, it's quite like it's you know, my wetsuits like you know, year thick. Um, so you're wearing a hundred pounds worth of gear with your weights and that kind of thing. So it's very technical diving. It means if you ever go abroad and dive, it's really easy. It's like being in a swim yeah. pool. Uh, but uh, yeah, cycling tends to be most. I'm, I I road race cycle during the week uh, weekends, and I'm kind of on a. Between me and work and home, um, I'm on sort of road for half of it and uh, cycle track, old railway lines uh, for the, the other half. So I use a cycle cross bike to come in and work. So it's uh, yeah, it keep, keeps you fairly trim, allows you to eat what you want. So it's uh, pretty cool. So, so what I'm getting is that you're you're quite a disciplined, quite quite an ambitious but disciplined, and um, and you kind of you need a lot of drive not only to to. <laughs> you're doing but also to even maintain the hobbies that you maintain so it's yeah yeah personality type that's coming through um, yeah so with that in mind if you weren't a dentist if you hadn't chosen dentistry what would you have loved to have done or what would you now say possibly that you do instead well people might say it's lunacy but i, I want to be a dentist from the age of 12 but Me before too. then before then i want to be an rf pilot wow so yeah, but then back in the old, you'll be able to work out my age here. When I was twelve, it was the Falklands War, okay. and I remember seeing a plane being shot out of the sky <laughs> on the TV, and I thought, ah, <laughs> I like a certain amount of risk. But <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, most of the hobbies I do just indicate, you know, they are very focused lunacy type drives, and kind of, mm. I think every everybody in dentistry has to have that kind of. We all we're all we're all cut from the same cloth. It's uh, yeah. We, we tend you tend to find a lot of dentists do cycle and mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of thing. So sorry about that. So Richard, just to conclude, I mean, we're we're very excited to have you. Could you just summarise for us the title of your session? Maybe who's supporting you in the session as well, and um, and where where it, where where it's going to be, and uh, and um, just a, just a summary of, of kind of the topic you'll be covering. Uh, well, it's down in London, the uh, Engineers Institute. Um, it's going to be it's a fantastic location. I had the opportunity to have a quick glance in while I was in London recently. Um, it will be I'm doing a morning and an afternoon session. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's going to be a really cool session. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And what what else did, was it you wanted to, to know? Is there anyone? Are you working with anyone on the on the hands on? Is it just yourself? Are you working with any trade partners? Uh, I work with DMG Dental. Um, I, I've used a lot, an awful lot of composite resins in the past, and an awful lot of composite systems are fantastic. Um, I'll tell you why I like their system on the day. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly for me, it's more the handling than anything else. A lot of composites come with some great attributes now, mm -hmm. but the actual handling and a certain amount of opacity that 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 allows me to work with a certain composite that I like. I can work with all sorts of different composites. You know, it's uh, they're, yeah. they're not going to have the uh, 
Um, my trade partner, DMG, may, may not want me to uh, say this, but uh, I will discuss other, other materials. Um, yeah. I think there's an awful lot of instruments that are required for the kind of dentistry I do. Um, it sometimes is about the tools when, when you're working. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's various forms of, I see people with loops all the time. And personally, I mean, I, I, I get the opportunity when I travel to talk to the likes of Manier and some of the real big guys. And um, and when we've sat down before and said, what kind of magnification do you think? I think for cosmetic dentistry, it's times four mm. and, and above. Mm. Um, and that's certainly the consensus. But I'll go through sort of the tools, etc. If anybody on the course wants to know which instruments I use and which which burrs I use, a fairly standard set of burrs you can get from any company. Um, yeah. But tap, it, it's how you use them, you know. It's, uh, and for me, and uh, a lot of it's kind of put down quite often. The finish of a composite is very important, and I have a very certain protocol as to how I get that shine and that long lasting shine through to composites. And I'll go through that in detail and. There are lots of different pieces of kit from lots of different manufacturers that are brought together into a certain protocol. It's not all. DMG simply provide me with some of the tools for the actual stent and certainly the composite. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to actually telling everybody why I use what I use yeah. and what, what each piece of equipment that I use represents and how it helps because a lot of people don't realize that some of these bursts, some of these polishers have to be run at different speeds as well. Mm. Yeah. And if you're just using an air roller, that can't be done. Yeah. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll go over that. It's, uh, sometimes it's worth the initial investment, which isn't huge. Yeah. So it sounds, like, it sounds like anyone attending is going to get not only clinical skills, a little bit about the business side, implementation in terms of communicating to patients, as well as uh, actually what they need in order to get it done as well. So it's an all rounded um session so thank you yeah. so much richard for joining us absolute uh, pleasure to talk to you today jet sam so it's been a pleasure really appreciate your time and we appreciate you uh you know giving up your your weekend of being at bacd conference it's always a pleasure to see you there on a social side as well as as a speaker and as a delegate of course so, we love to see you nice to catch up and oh, uh, i'm from yeah. newcastle you've got to have a beer <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So if anyone hasn't yet chosen their hands-on sessions and are listening to this or watching this and do want to go ahead and book onto Richard's session, then you can do via the BACD website. Uh, if you haven't bought your conference tickets, just don't leave them too late because there will be a cutoff and we will close the bookings when they get sold out. They're sold out. We can't really easily squeeze people in. There are limits. Uh, and having seen Richard's teaching firsthand and his dentistry, which we will uh, throw onto the screen in various points in this podcast too, so you can kind of have a bit of a relevance as to what we're talking about. Uh, then uh, you'll be no doubt eager to come along and learn more. But thank you once again, Richard, and look forward to seeing all those listening and watching at the conference later in the week.